Welcome to Diversity Conversations, where we engage in thought-provoking dialogue to identify leadership solutions to today's most challenging conflicts. Stream live each week, Saturday, 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m., hosted by diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist and CEOs Eric Ellis and Tommy Lewis. Join us and add your voice to this engaging diversity conversation. Good morning, Greater Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky, the United States, and the world. My name is Eric Ellis. I'm the president and CEO of Integrity Development Corporation, and I'm your host today. I'm usually joined by my good friend and brother, Tommy Lewis, but Tommy Lewis is out on location uh, participating in a golf outing, and I think they're having some difficulty with internet services, so we are uh, said that we won't have Tommy uh, Lewis join us today, but we've got a guest that's going to do a phenomenal job, and Dr. Reggie Crane will bring him up shortly, but I'm just so glad and so excited to have my friend and brother, uh, Dr. Reggie, join us in the conversation today. This week, as I look back over my week, I was in Louisville, Kentucky this week, uh, spent some time with a, a wonderful client there uh, doing some uh, executive leadership training uh, with the CEO and the top 26 leaders there, had a chance to uh, sort of uh, get them engaged in what it takes to go to that next level. We did some coaching, some one-on-one -on -one coaching. I'm just so proud of this organization and their CEO. Uh, I've given him a couple books to read and he's read them and reading them twice. Uh, but uh, one of the things that he shared that was so powerful for me is that he spent time uh, going out on the road with many of his workers uh, and seeing what they did and just walking with them and, and learning with them. And he said there are some things that he thought he understood about the business that he's led and been a part of for the last 17 years, he said, but he learned some new things uh, over the last several months that have been powerful and it shifted the way that he leads. And so I just think that it's so important for people to understand when we talk about creating environments that are diverse, equitable and inclusive, that's not just political correctness. That's really about helping leaders create people-centered workplaces because when you value your people, when you respect them, when you uh, you know are equitable toward them, when you give them a sense of belonging, uh, there's nothing that they won't do to bring about positive results within that organization. So I'm grateful that uh, I and my team, I had Wendell there, uh, Kathy Scrivener, Dr. Stacy. Uh, uh, First Holloway was there with us as well, and we were just grateful. Had a chance to go to uh, a lounge there, the Black Jockey Lounge, and learned a lot about uh, Black jockeys that I didn't know. I didn't know that they were among the first jockeys in the Kentucky Derby, and that overwhelmingly, almost, you know, a lot of the jockeys were African American, uh, you know, at the beginning. And one of the most uh, celebrated winners. Uh, I think a gentleman that won over 50 races was African-American. So we were at the Black Jockey Lounge. They brought out some bottles of bourbon that they had with Black Jockeys on uh, the bottle. And they just sold out. I mean, I think they had 500 or something bottles that they uh, manufactured. Man, those things were gone in no time flat. And so that's a story that needs to be told. And so uh, it was one I was grateful to learn about. The other thing that I did uh, just yesterday is I serve uh, on the Cincinnati Reds uh, DEI advisory board. And so they asked me to, uh, if, if I and my family wouldn't mind uh, opening up the game yesterday by singing the national anthem, uh, because it was the African-American Community Day for the Cincinnati Reds. And so uh, myself, my wife, uh, my oldest uh, daughter, Jillian, and my youngest son, Ethan, all joined together to sing the national anthem. And so I think that Brooke might have this here. And so we're going to just pull this up and play this for our audience, those of you that didn't have to see it. Wow. Who's 
Thank you. And so uh, we we had a wonderful time. Uh, you know, I had been nervous most of the week because I was out of town and we didn't get a chance to practice a lot. But uh, I was just so moved and grateful uh, to have my family uh, joining me. I mean, that's just a memorable experience uh, to have your wife and your children singing with you, uh, you know, before a Cincinnati Reds baseball game. And uh, the African American community was there, and just really, we had a had a great time. Uh, my favorite part is when it's all over. You know, I was so glad for us to hit that last note and to have not embarrassed the family. So uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, today, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, Memorial Day, since this is Memorial Day weekend, and I think that it's so important for us to be able to move beyond just simply looking at this as. Uh, you know, uh, a day of travel, go see our relatives and do some barbecuing. Now, I'm, I'm all up for that. I like a good barbecue, but I think that it's important for us to understand uh, the real meaning behind this, uh, this holiday. And so I've invited uh, back to join us uh, a Dr. Reggie Crane. And so we're going to bring him uh, to the stage and uh, sort of... Uh, Dr. Reggie, how are you this morning? Man, it is absolutely outstanding day, man. Every time I get a chance to start a Saturday morning off, man, with you and Brother Tommy, man, it just makes the whole week come to a very, very value-added conclusion, man. <laughs> well, we are always, uh, it's always an honor to have you with us, Professor. You know, I see you got your charts there right behind you. So you're always uh, ready to to uh, both learn and to teach. Absolutely. I love absolutely. that about you. We want to welcome our community and thank you all for joining us this morning. Joe Jackson, uh, we uh, both uh, played at Wright State University. He played a few years after me, but uh, so glad. Every time I see your name show up, Joe, I love you, man. I really do. I love who you are as a father, as a friend, uh, and I appreciate your support. Cheryl Ladd, so glad to have you joining us this morning. Robert Smith, appreciate you and all the rest of you that have chosen to join us this morning. We are grateful to have you. Dr. Reggie, what I'd like to do, man, is just start off by having you uh, tell people a little bit, a bit about who you are and sort of just take the long road, if you will, and just walk us through uh, your growing up, uh, you know, years and, uh, you know, your family and sort of help us to understand what are the experiences, who are the people that have shaped you into who you are today? Because I think that these stories and these values are not something that people often hear and see. And so we'll talk about that. And then we're going to go into the uh, your experience with the Air Force and Memorial Day and all that kind of stuff. Got it, my friend. Thanks, Eric, again for having me on the show, man. Um, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, uh, you know, uh, had three brothers. Um, Mother and father got divorced relatively early on. They were trying to figure some things out and they couldn't work it out. Uh, and so I was kind of like, um, I was the oldest. So a lot of the shepherding and herding of things in the house kind of fell on me. 
so I, I often joke with my mother sometimes. I kind of felt like she and I were kind of going through this thing together as far as growing up was concerned. Mm. Uh, but uh, I, was, um, I was the first grandson that my grandfather had. He lived in New York City. And so every summer, uh, he would make, make it a point that I would come and spend the summer with him. Okay. Now, he was a minister, uh, and, um, and so there was a lot of church, right? <laughs> oh, man. But I know that. <laughs> my mother I, uh, was a preacher. My grandmother was a preacher. So, you yeah, know, yeah. church all my whole yeah. childhood. Yeah, I had a really small, really small uh, congregation in New York City, uh, 121st and Lenox Avenue. But uh, very dedicated people, man. And um, on Saturdays, as a way of helping to pay the bills, uh, the members would come in. A lot of the older ladies would come in and they'd, they'd cook dinners in the, in the, in the church uh, kitchen and they'd sell the dinners, right? Right. And I'd go out and deliver some of those dinners, man, okay. to some really interesting parts of town. <laughs> 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 you ducking in and out to get your dinners in. Huh? <laughs> you know, and sometimes, man, I, I think back now and I say, if I knew now what I knew then, would I have, uh, you know, ventured into some of those areas? But I, I think that it was it was the Lord's work, man. We was trying to feed people. So hey, brothers, I'm just coming in with dinners now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, cold, I, man. So you had to feed up, huh? You yeah. Had to feed up. <laughs> So I, um, I, uh, a lot of my values, man, uh, were kind of molded by him just in those three months in the summer. Um, he taught me a lot about choice uh, mm -hmm. because one, um, one Sunday we got up and I had made some plans to go and hang out with some friends in Staten Island. And so I said, uh, I used to call him dad. I said, dad, um, do I have to go to church this morning or can I go with my friend to watch Staten Island? And he said, um, what do you want to do? And I said, so I can choose? He said, yeah. It, it's so He said, you never have to go. I just assume you always wanted to go, right? Right. So in that moment, I said, okay, well, church is out from this point out, right? <laughs> but the, the strangest thing happened. I didn't go that Sunday, but the following Sunday, I got up and went back because it it wasn't so much that I felt like I had to go when he said it was my choice. Mm. That was one of the first times in my life that I could recall I had a choice. I had a, a decision to make in terms of how I spent my time when it uh, involved an adult being involved in the situation. Right. And so I continued to go because I actually enjoyed it, man. Um, you know, we got a chance to get in our little Sunday school group and we memorize our little lessons. And if we get a chance to come before the congregation to kind of share what we learned and get those applause and uh and you know and just it just kind of made you feel man like you were connected to something right and people kind of valued what you were doing even though you really weren't doing a whole lot man <laughs> but it was the value of that right and so um i think i also um from him uh, you know he oh, hold on reggie don't hold it just for a second you know i have to slow things down yeah. sometimes yeah. man that is so powerful what you just shared about your grandfather giving you the freedom to choose. Yeah. And I think that that's something that uh, is important for us to remember as parents, but it's also important for us to remember as individuals. Because I would say that in conversations that you and I have had, about decisions that you're even in the midst of making. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's so important that you always give yourself the freedom to choose. Yeah. What's the pathway that I most want to go? Because when we give ourselves the freedom to choose, then I think that we make decisions that we can then feel more, uh, you know, more comfortable in making those decisions and more committed to the actions and the decisions that we make. So I just I think that's such an important reminder for yeah. us, but also for you in where you are even right now. Yeah. And just to kind of piggyback on that, too, Eric, and I, I, I don't want to be disrespectful or anything, but, but sometimes you find yourself in conversations with certain people and based on where they are in life, they say that, well, you know, I don't have the options to choose like you have. Right. Right. And, and sometimes 
I used to let that let that go, but I've gotten to the point now where I say, okay, granted, but let's talk about the options that you do have, right? right. Uh, let's not compare ourselves to somebody else and because we don't have those options, automatically assume that we have no options, right? Right. And 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 so I, I think it's just really powerful because we you know, we can find ourselves in situations based on situ- on th- things that, you know, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't develop, right. but we find ourselves in these spaces in life where life hits us hard sometimes, right? right? But even in those times when life is like just wailing on us, man, right. there's still some slither of some decisions and choices that we can make to help us to kind of start moving through that process, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's a great point, great point. Right, right, right. Go ahead and continue, man. I didn't want to interrupt. I appreciate you sharing sort of the things that have brought you to where you are. Help us to understand how you got to the Air Force. It's really interesting, man. I am um, in high school and junior high school and high school. I was in band, I played percussions. Right. And so when I was uh, graduating senior high school, I think a lot of us had like scholarships to go to um either Shaw University, Albany State University, or FAMU. Well, <laughs> FAMU was, was a spot, right? <laughs> and so uh, I got a chance to go down and um, experience the summer orientation, right? And I'm not sure if you're familiar with FAMU marching band. Oh, but yeah. They, they treat those folks like, uh, like rock stars down right. there. Right. And so in that brief summer that I was there, I realized that young Reggie Crane had did not have the discipline uh, to go there and to academically engage <laughs> and, and do all those beautiful thing. people around, man. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, bro. And you a rock star out there with the family you Oh, yeah. Yes, that, that was it. That, that I mean, my, my heart was there. <laughs> but right. My head was like, look, man, this ain't gonna work out. And so one of my friends who also had the scholarship, he had made a decision earlier to go into the Air Force. Okay. And he came back home uh, that summer and he had a pocket full of money, he had a new car and some incredible stories to tell, right? Right. And so as I listened to him, uh, he taught me everything about how to fold the clothes in basic training. And he right. said, Reg, here's the deal, man. He said, they can't hit you. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. So, so whatever else they say. So when he, he said, don't get in your face, man, and talk about your parents and all those kind of things, but they can't hit you. Right. And so I said, well, um, I'm in. <laughs> and so I, I, I joined, man. And, and it was it was an experience, man, because when I got to basic training, a lot of the folks in basic training had not been around uh, anybody who didn't look like them. Right. Where uh, the summers I spent in New York City, my grandfather lived in this um this, uh, this apartment complex that had five buildings. In those five buildings, there were 24, 20 floors in each building, right? There were Nigerian people, there were uh, African people, uh, there were Hispanic people, there were Caucasian people. There were all kinds of people just in his building. Right. And so every day, I mean, out playing in the playground, I'm interacting with these folks, man. And so seeing, being around a lot of people that w- was different wasn't a really big deal for me, right? And it yeah. served me really well. Right. And so once I made it uh, through basic uh, training, uh, my first job was a Morse code operator copying dits and dies. And I went to Italy to do that. Right. And um, I said, wow, this is pretty interesting, man. Uh, my first assignment, I'm going to Italy and um, I, I got over there and I think I got my real first taste of being in the military in a real environment right. uh, because I had a supervisor who uh, said to me that he thought, everybody who looked like me should have either gone to the Marines or the army. Right. Mm. And so didn't quite know how to process that. Right. Uh, I'm all the way across the world. Uh, I can't leave. Uh, and so uh, I think I called my dad and said, you know what, man, I don't know if this is going to work out. Mm. And he said, well, you got to make it work out <laughs> at least until this person enlistment is up. Right. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, slowly but surely, man, I, I, I realized that during that time period, the, the country as probably well as the military, man, was going through changes, man. It was the end of the Vietnam era war, um, you know, trying to find spaces and places to fit uh, people and, 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 and just ideas about 
how to treat people, man, were just, I, I thought at one point in time, when you came into something like the military, like you come through this filter, right? And it kind of cleanses you of all the stuff that's not good. And right. so on the other side of that, it's all good. Well, right. it didn't work that way, man. I mean, you would come into the military and we bring all of that stuff right. uh, that we bring with us. And so now we're here and we got to figure out a way to kind of coexist as we try to make a mission go, right? So mm. it, it was just, um, it was it was eye-opening initially that, um, a lot of things I had not even been exposed to in the civilian sector, right? Right. Like I had never been called the N word when I was a civilian. Wow. It was in the military where I was first called the N word, and the guy said, "Don't know N, don't don't know nigger, tell me what to do," right? And so, right. That was kind of interesting because I'm sitting there, I'm saying to myself, "Okay, how many other people feel this way, right? I mean, I'm right. I'm brand new to this whole thing. I don't I don't know." But slowly, what I began to understand was probably just like out in the civilian sector, man, uh, that was a minority of viewpoints. Right. Uh, and there was some other people out there uh, that were right thinking uh, yeah. and were, were, were extremely helpful in terms of guiding me on my path. Now, so say that again, because I think that that's an important concept for people to hear. Yeah, I, I think it was only a minority, a small percentage of people. I, you know, I and, and I tell you, there, there is something to the fact, man, that um, understanding demographically where people grow up and how they grow up uh, and how some people never really leave where they grow up and they continue to embrace and reproduce those same kind of thoughts and behaviors. Uh, you know, it was 1995. Uh, when I was uh, I was stationed um, at a base called um, uh, it was in Louisiana, right? It was right outside Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, Barksdale. Mm -hmm. I was living in the community out there, uh, and uh, this guy came to my house. I wasn't there; my wife was there. Uh, and he said to her, "He said, look, um, I'm I'm so and so from across the street, and just here to let you know uh, that if if you're walking around and somebody happens to call you a nigger, don't worry about it." That's just how we do things here, right? And so I got home that night, right? And my wife was a little timid about something. And so automatically I assume I did something wrong. Right, right, right. right. I know how to mess up. I'm getting the silence treatment. I'm getting the silence treatment. I know I did something. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for whatever it is, right? right. And I won't do that again, right? I don't know what it is, but I'm sorry. <laughs> And so she said, no, uh, this is what happened. And so I kind of went over to his house and I said, look, um, Here's the thing, right? Uh, we don't we don't use that word in our house. Uh, we don't like anybody using that word towards us. So what I would respectfully ask you to do is if you know anybody who would use that word towards us, let them know that we're not going to take kindly to that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and please don't come to my house again, right? Mm -hmm. Now we never we never experienced that from anybody. Right. Uh, but the mere fact that in 1995, in a certain part of the country, someone could could come up to you and say, "Look, right. here's right. the deal. Here's right. how we do things here." Right. Right. Uh, in 1995, right. and you you needed to let him know that there's a man here in this house that really you you don't come freely over to my house with that kind of work. Yeah. yeah. So, so you were just uh, with a quickness trying to get over to that house, weren't you? Yeah, and, and you know, yeah. with all due respect here, Eric, uh, and I want to say that because I don't want to make, I don't want to sound disrespectful, but as I started moving around that little town and I started watching how uh, Caucasian people would engage some of the older African-American men, it was almost like watching a movie, man, stepping back in time yeah. where there was this yeah. subservient uh, nature yeah. where you you did that if you encountered somebody Caucasian you did that right. and I, I I just looked at that and um, I mean it, it it was moving I mean to <clears throat> to see to see that right I mean to not read about it not look at a movie but to see that right uh, it, it just it, it was just it, it, it touched me and it, it made an indelible impression on my mind about the way that you live your life Reg is not the way that everybody else is afforded the opportunity to live their life, right? So we right. still got some things that we got to deal with in this country. Right, and so you're seeing on one hand, here you've made the decision to serve your country, 
uh, to protect and serve, uh, to go across the world if necessary, so that we might have our freedom. Yeah. Uh, and then to live in communities where there are individuals that don't seem to recognize the value of that and will still perpetuate some of this uh, ugliness. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's important for us to, we'll just pivot slightly, but for people to understand what it means to uh, make a commitment uh, to serve this country and to put your life on the line. I'd like you to help paint a picture because most people in this country, I don't know, it feels like a, a, a un, unspoken, an unwritten rule that people in the military don't really talk a lot about their experiences, especially even those that have been in wartime experience. If you can help us, those of us that have not served, to understand what all goes through your mind when you're making this decision uh, to serve the country, and when does it change from just a career option, you know, go to college or go to the ROTC, you know, uh, when does it change from that to a realization that people are dying? You know, you make a really, really um, uh, impactful point, man. Uh, when I joined initially, um, I had no conceptual idea possibly dying, right? I mean, yeah, you raise your hand and you say, yeah, I solemnly swear to defend and protect you, do all of that. Um, but then you go to basic training, you go to a school to learn a job, then you go and do the job. Now, in the Air Force, it's probably a little different than the Marines in the Army, because uh, in the Air Force, you go to learn a job and then you learn some ancillary duty that you would do if you go to war later on. Right. So I had, uh, I'd been in the Air Force, um, my third assignment, man. Um, before it really hit me, it was when uh, Desert Shield and Desert Storm was going on. I was in, I was in, I was in England. I was in in, in the UK, and uh, we had um, started talking about everybody on the base had to now receive some training uh, that if you happen to deploy into that environment, this is the now wartime skill that you will engage in if you go over there. Right. So. The first day that that briefing was held and I had to go in and, and, and recertify on the M16 and learn about gas masks and all the biological things that could happen. I came home that night and I called my dad. Right. I said, look, uh, <clears throat> I want to make sure all of my affairs are in order. Right. And I want to make sure that if anything happens, uh, that you will help my wife move through this process because I know it would be very challenging for her to have to take all of this in. And so my dad was like, uh, he's a guy that doesn't really get emotional, man. And he was like, well, no, everything's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And I could hear in his voice. And I said, no, man, I said, we need to have this conversation because I, I, I understood today quite clearly that if my number is called and I have to go, I'm not suggesting that I am not going to come back. But I understand that there's a realization because there were people who had gone and they did not come back, right? So yeah. this is a realization. I just want to make sure that we have this conversation now before anything happens. And that was the first time, Eric, where in my head, I really had to kind of wrap my head around the fact that this is the bigger picture, man. This is the picture that you were kind of maybe shielded from or sheltered from, uh, but this is the real deal. And so now when the opportunity presents itself again for you to either choose to want to stay, re-enlist or go, this now needs to become a part of that conversation or that thinking process in terms of whether you choose to stay or go. That's, uh, that's powerful because when you are in the military through long periods of peace, and now all of a sudden we are in the midst of wars, uh, that's a very different calculation than the GI Bill or all the benefits that I can get in education and all like, well, that stuff ain't free. Yeah. There's, a, there's a potential cost that's on the line. And so as we pivot to uh, sort of Memorial Day, and as we pivot through trying to understand the mindset of those that have served, those that have been lost, yeah. 
what are some of the things that they've seen, Reggie, that uh, is hard to shake when they sort of come back? Those that survive when they come back to the civilian world, what are they? What are they fighting? You know, there, there's a lot that's been written about this, Eric. Uh, I know a couple of older veterans who I've talked with, and to your point, um, they don't really want to share a whole lot, right? Uh, but because we've kind of established a relationship over the course of time, uh, they have shared some things with me. And one of the things that one of these gentlemen shared with me is that when you have somebody in your unit, right, that you get up and you go to breakfast with and you have lunch with and you argue with and you fight with and you laugh with and you cry with and you share birthdays and family situations. And you have to look at that person. And they're not living anymore, right? This one guy said, man, that is the thing that that haunts me to this day, because even though he said I was over in the situation where there was bullets flying and everything, I just always thought that we would be okay. He and I would be okay and he'd get back and I'd get back and we'd go back to our lives. And so he said he thinks about that like mm -hmm. just constantly, man. And I I couldn't, I said, I can't even empathize with that man because I have no reference. I have no way of sitting here saying, you know what? I, I get it because I can't see that world. I've never had to do that. And I and I, I can just imagine the magnitude where when you have to in, endure that constantly, consistently over periods of time. I mean, you, you think about uh, we talked earlier about the Tuskegee Airmen. Right. And you think right. about uh, when uh, what they were doing and you think about the fact that those those pilots could not rotate back to the country because right. in that time, uh, for if you were a pilot and you rotated back to the country, you rotated back to the country as a flight instructor. Well, there was very few places for these guys to rotate back to, so they had to stay. Now, they were very at what they did, but I can only imagine being over there for those extended periods of time, and some of these guys has kind of talked about it, what they see and what they're exposed to constantly, constantly, over and over again, man. And so it's, it's it's one of those situations where I don't really have a whole lot of firsthand knowledge. Right, that, right. Um, but the few people who I've talked to, that has been the thing that has come up constantly, man, about losing somebody that you put your life in their hand, they put their life in your hand, and, and you take that very seriously. And then when one of you happens to not make it, the guilt that that carries or uh, that goes with the other person as they're traversing this world, man, it's, um, it's, it's a pretty heavy load to carry. Right. And uh, what is the importance of the military? Because people sometimes talk about this, Reggie, as though it's plainly a political issue. And you can just simply sit back and either be for or against the military uh, without truly understanding the value of a military. I, I like the, the, uh, the Secretary of State. I like the State Department. But there's sometimes in this nasty world that we live in that talk and negotiation runs its course. Yeah, I... I think there's a lot to what you're saying, man. Um, I think every country, right, has their own military and it's designed to help them protect and preserve their way of life right in the world. And then you have countries that kind of come together and say, okay, we're going to, in terms of having agreements, we're going to work with each other to make sure that we all are going to be good. Um, but the, the military is controlled by civilian leadership. Uh, and, and that's, part of that whole process is to make sure that we don't just, you know, have the military run amok and just kind of do the, have their will, right. As far as the country is concerned. Wow. So it's kind of like a check and balance. Wow. Okay. And so I, I, I think, I think to your point, right. I don't know if the military has never not been political. I think, right. I think maybe what's happened is it's been a whole lot more visible uh, in certain situations now because of the internet, because of some of the personalities yeah. uh, that are engaged in some of these dialogues. 
I think it's a whole lot more front and center now in terms of the political influences that are on the military. Right. Right. I, 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 but I gotta, I gotta believe deep down in the core of my being, man, uh, that the military, uh, that the, the the four star generals that are in charge of each one of these branches, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, at the core of it all, they understand the tremendous responsibility they have uh, to make sure that they're doing the right thing, uh, you know, for the right reasons, uh, and they don't allow themselves to to be used in some kind of political fashion. Right. Pivot for just a minute to help us understand why this Russian Ukrainian war has meaning to us. Well, um, I, I think we, we we look at the, the the food chain, right? We look at the amount of what is it? Is is it is it wheat? Um, I, f I forgot the right, that the Ukraines are making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's a. There's a product that uh, it's not soybean, but it's uh, right. It's something that the whole world they they they're the sort of the farmer for the world. Yeah, seventy like percent of this crop. And they, and and because of the blockades, they can't get anything out of there, right? Um, and so it, it becomes an, an, an American concern. It becomes a European concern. It, it, I think it becomes a, a a Eastern concern as well. But but the fact of the matter is because of the fact that Ukraine is not currently a member of NATO, right. uh, it, it, it's kind of hands off, right? And we have right. to, well, we, we have to sit back and kind of watch this thing play out and hopefully it plays out in a, in a way where it just starts to minimize the damage, man, that's being done to people's lives and the damage that's being done to the world economy behind right. that, that whole issue over there. So it's important to for a lot of reasons, yeah. Because right, we have invested, I think, upwards of $55 billion uh, in uh, to Ukraine to uh, to shore up. We're doing everything we can uh, that's uh, sort of not a direct confrontation with Russia. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I, I admire that. It's interesting. I'm listening uh, because it is very tangential to us. And we always have to kind of be considering nuclear weapons. And, uh, you know, at what point does Russia get so desperate that they, uh, you know, go to the next next level? And uh, I don't know if uh, I, I, I imagine that preparations that people are gaming that out. There's no way we're not, you know. Yeah, I've uh, I've, I've been I've been told, man, I've read uh, in several different publications that the, the Pentagon game plans, everything. I mean, there's probably not any possibility they have not sat down and, and considered because they have to, right? I mean, uh, I, I, I think- um, You cannot be caught flat-footed on this. Yeah, you can't, man. And 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 to, and it kind of gave me a different kind of appreciation um, and, and respect for what happens in the Pentagon to your point earlier about, you know, sometimes you're just shielded from things but as you start to look at things that happen in the world and, and you realize the responsibility that those folks have to plan for these contingencies, man, I mean, it's got to be just an enormous task, man, to make sure that you are staying up to date and that you have these actual plans. So when something rolls out as close as possible to needing to do something, whatever that something is, right. you've got something on the table that you can execute. Right. Help us to understand, I'm going to try to tie this together a little bit. Help us to understand the mindset of some of the veterans, uh, uh, United States veterans that looked at this Ukrainian thing and saw and felt as though Russia was simply bullying them. And they sort of just went there as sort of mercenaries, free citizens, Help us to understand how that ties to a level of loyalty. Is there something about being in the military that feels just and like your present day, almost superheroes, protectors of humanity and right? Is there an element of that in the in those decisions? I think in some of the veterans that I, I've kind of talked with, and not a whole lot of them really want to talk about it, man, mm -hmm. uh, because... They, they believe that it's, it's become so politicized uh, mm -hmm. that it it minimizes the ability 
for you and I to have a conversation about it because if your political affili- affiliations is this and mine is that, then we're not going to be able to have the dialogue that we need to talk about, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I've not had a whole lot of conversations with veterans about that because they don't want to go there. But I can tell you in general, um, you know, a, a lot of them are concerned uh, about, they're concerned about inaction and they're concerned right. about action. Right, right. And, and both of those have severe consequences. Yeah, yeah. And and, and so on, on that level, we've been able to have some kind of high level dialogues about, well, you, you know the rules of engagement, either you're in NATO or you're not. Uh, and so the mere fact that you're not in NATO, then that kind of ties the U.S.'s right. hands. Right. And then when you talk about the, the unpredictability of, 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 of Russia, man, in terms of the threat, the potential threat of, of nuclear weapons, I mean, that's, that's a consideration that you, you can't take lightly because if, if somebody has it, uh, then you, you, you have to be thinking about if, I, if they got it, that they could potentially use it. Exactly. And 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 what, what scares me about the whole thing is that ego and pride and testosterone are 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 challenges, man, that can lead very quickly uh, to nuclear destruction. You, you know, you know, Eric, it's, it's almost like if um, I, I live in a I live in a an area maybe 10 miles from your house, right? And I got my neighborhood, you got your neighborhood, and I've kind of sized you up. I sized your neighborhood up, and I believe that I could come over and roll over you, man, in about two days and get what I need. Right. Well, I come over on 1 July, and it's like September now, right? <laughs> and uh, so my right. options are, well, I can back up and say, you know, Eric, <laughs> My bad, man. I didn't know uh, you was going to put up as much of a fight. Yeah. Oh, I can just, you know, figure out, okay, so what are my other options right now while I'm digging in and continuing to do the damage I'm doing right now? And, you know, so you, you talk about ego, man. Um, you know, sometimes that behavior, that drive to succeed, that drive to say, you know what, I said I was going to do this. I believe I can do this and I am going to do this no matter what the cost is. Right. And we have seen that. And people that are used to having their way for decades and really their voice going unchallenged, uh, it gives you a sense of power and entitlement uh, that is is hard to uh, to imagine. Uh, I've got to think, though, that there are forces within Russia, for example, that have to be considering if this is sustainable with Putin. Because, and that's why you have to spread that pain out. You have to spread that pain out so that no one who has the ability to influence him finds it comfort, finds comfort in supporting and continuing to support him. Because it's easy to take out one guy than it is to try to then recover from one guy making some tragic. Uh, you know, calculations, miscalculations that could be damaging uh, to the world. But it's the reason why the work that we do in diversity and everything else, anything that's sort of building towards respect and and community is uh, some of the most essential conversations that we need to be having uh, on planet Earth. You know, you, 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 I think you're absolutely spot on. And um, in the psychological safety, uh, uh, Tim Scott's uh, four stages of psychological safety, the fourth stage is challenging the status quo. Yeah. When you believe that uh, you have something of uh, value to offer uh, to help ensure that we're making the best decisions possible, but you've gone through those prior three stages, right? Where I bring you in and make you feel like you're accepted, uh, you learn, uh, you make your small contributions, uh, and now you're able to challenge the status quo. When you're in situations, man, where nobody is willing or able or feels that they can challenge the status quo, what happens is you start taking your own counsel. I mean, you start playing your own music in your head. Uh, and uh, sooner or later, like you said, I mean, you look at the news now and and whatever businesses that are in Russia that were serving everyday people, I mean, they're talking about the fact that how much they're losing. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it, it's a situation that really is not tenable. tenable and right. 
and, and so what what happens? I mean, you don't have a democracy uh, right. in terms of being able to go to the polls. I mean, right. you you vote, but I mean, you're stuck with this guy. You, exactly. You're stuck with this guy. And here's the thing that I think that for all the peace lovers, I'm a peace lover, yeah. but I'm not a foolish peace lover. Uh, for all the foolish peace lovers that think you can get everything done on the uh, you know end of rose petals, yeah, uh, I would suggest that. The only reason why Putin hasn't pulled a nuclear trigger yet is because he fears what we might unleash. He fears our knowledge of him and everything he has. Because if it was just a matter of surprise us and blow up New York, that had already been done. Yeah. And so the military and what happens in those branches is critical to peace. I think you're absolutely right. And I, th I think, uh, you know, the intelligence services of the world, every country has their own right. to a certain degree. They have real clarity and awareness about, you know, right. to a certain degree, what right. other countries have. Right. And right. I think I think you're spot on. I think um, for somebody to pull that trigger, I think that they have a real clear understanding of what that would mean from a retaliation standpoint. Exactly. But I think I think the key is still you have to treat that right with a certain degree of skepticism because you don't want to go there. Right. Uh, you don't want to go there. But you can't get caught flat footed. Exactly. Exactly. You cannot get caught hoping for the best, hoping yeah. that it would never. Uh, matter of fact, sometimes you even look preemptive, you know, right. but your intelligence is what you're then leaning in on. Yeah. So let's let's return our conversation back to uh, Memorial Day. Mm. Memorial Day, uh, the first Memorial Day was in 1868, following the uh, Civil War, uh, called Decoration uh, yeah. Day, where uh, people came to Arlington Cemetery, I guess, and, uh, 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 you know, and, and really brought flowers for Confederates and Union uh, soldiers. And uh, then after World War II, I think we changed it to Memorial Day. Yeah. Uh, help us to understand what that the meaning of Memorial Day is for you and what should it be for us? Yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly about the idea that, yeah, we can fire up the grills and, and invite people over and do that. Um, but at the same time, it's about remembering uh, those men and women uh, who donned a uniform uh, and um, and didn't did, and, and didn't make it back. Uh, either they were killed in war uh, or they're missing still in action. Uh, we still have quite a few people who, if they're dead, their remains have not been returned. Mm. Uh, we just don't know where they are. Uh, they call either missing in action or killed in action. And so it's about just remembering, um, again, that these folks made the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, they raised their hand and said, yeah, I will support and defend. But then when the country said, okay, I need for you to now go and do that, they went. Uh, and uh, and for some reason, it didn't make it through being killed or dismissing. And so it's about trying to remember, right, um, those folks. And, and sometimes I think, Eric, man, we can lose sight of that, man, uh, in terms of um, complaining about, you know, our situation today. Uh, I, I, I recall I was... When I was stationed in Wichita, Kansas, I had the, the, the real blessing to be stationed here, um, really small base. Uh, and I got connected with this group of retired military people. And I remember the first I got there in the in spring and I had to go to training and came back that summer. And I was sitting in the club having a glass of wine and this big, robust, just effervacious gentleman came over and said, Hi, young fella. My name is Charlie Pope. I want to give you a ticket to come to a picnic that we have every year, right? As so I went, and it was my first Juneteenth celebration. Mm. Where I got a chance to understand and appreciate that. And then a couple of days later, I was uh, sitting in the club, and these guys all had their wives there. Right. And so they got up to go to the bar, and I was sitting there with their wives. And their wives, man, started to tell me some of the stories about what their husbands had to go through just to survive and to thrive. And 
And they said, you know, some of these young people today, they don't get it. They don't understand the sacrifices of people like my husband. And, 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 and as they were sitting there, I said, man, they got their own story, man. They got their own perspective of what this whole thing was like watching their husbands, man, go through it, man, and having to deal with it. And, and so I just in that night, I kind of said to myself, you know what, Reg? Maybe you need to think more about what you can do as opposed to what kind of roadblocks people are putting in front of you because the roadblocks that folks are putting in front of you are nothing like the roadblocks, man, that these folks had to go through. And so uh, we just lost uh, one of those guys um, about five months ago. Uh, he was like the, uh, the, the, the the heartbeat of that whole group, uh, Charlie Pope. And um, God has taught me so much uh, about being a man, <laughs> you know, being a man in the military, uh, being a husband, uh, being a father. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, my son came in the Air Force, man. He did four years. He was smarter than me uh, because he he knew he wanted to be in the film business, right? So he came in, uh, and because of my rank, he was able to get guaranteed the job he wanted. He came in, he went to uh, the, 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 the Air Force School to learn how to do movies and edit. Did that four years, got out, took his uh, GI Bill, and went to L.A. Film School. When I went to, to kind of tie this thing into... There are certain things that you can't you can't put into words about being a veteran, Eric. And and mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it except through this example. Right when I went to basic training, uh, and I saw my son, uh, you know, march and, and graduate. When he finished the formation and he came to find me, he came <clears throat> and just collapsed in my arms, started crying. And he said, Dad, I understand. I get it, man. And and, and just in that that bond, man, that that he and I had to go through to, to share that space as a veteran now. I don't I don't know how to describe that, right? Because it's hard to explain it to somebody who hasn't gone through it, but I know that there's something that ties veterans together. And I think at the core of a lot of what um, what lies at us trying to find ways to move this country through a lot of things that we're dealing with now, I think at the core of that, man, I think veterans can play a, a really major role in that because I, um, I was reading this, this study done by the Pew Research Institute, and they looked at the, the makeup of Congress, I think starting back in the the early 50s. And they looked at the the percentage of veterans that was in the Congress. Right. Traced it through. And as the number of veterans started to decrease in Congress, the less productive Congress became, right? Mm. And, and there's something to that. And that yeah. you know if you you can have your thoughts and I can have my thoughts, but if you and I belong to this unit and we got a mission to get done. At a certain point in time, you and I just can't say, I'm taking my ball and go home. Right. We got to say, you know what? Let's figure this out, man. We can disagree, but let's figure this out and let's get things done. And after that's all said, no, we can go back and have a conversation about it later on. But right now, we got to get something done. Right. And I think unless you've been in an environment like that where you've been compelled to do that, it, it, it's hard to just introduce that as a concept. That's powerful, man. And uh, one of the uh, things that happened yesterday at the baseball game is that there was somebody that protested the national anthem. Mm. So here I am, my wife and I and our kids are singing the national anthem. And there's a ball player for the Giants that won't come out uh, for the national anthem because he was protesting our congressman's inactivity to all the killing that's happening, including those 19 children and uh, two teachers. And I think that that's exactly in lockstep with what you just said, that uh, when you just get involved in these things and it becomes you're just another political animal, you've lost the patriotism that's necessary. 
yeah. you've lost the the, 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 the the spirit of oneness that's necessary to make sure that we all survive. I don't care how I felt as you as a black man or white man or, you know, none of that. If we are on this field together, if there's a possibility yeah. that we have to be on this field and sacrifice our life, that, that's what your son was doing, saying, Dad, I understand now. Because subconsciously, unconsciously, I had to carry that weight all the time that at some point, my life, uh, the, the, the potential to lose my life may be called upon. And there's no other experience that any of us have yeah. where it is that potentially certain that you, your life could be at risk. Yeah. And there's something that ties people together who are willing to do that for a yeah. call. Yeah. I, I think it's spot on with that, Eric. And I, you know, there, there's some other conversation that I've had with some veterans, right, about the protesting of the national anthem. It's right. been pretty interesting. It's been pretty interesting. Um, you know, there's some who say, look, I don't care what it's about. Uh, you don't do that because right. this is the flag. Yeah. And, and I get that. Yeah. And, and I've heard others that say, you know what? That's the reason why we say I'll go over and lay down my life, man, to protect people's right to right. do whatever, exhibit their rights, right? Right. And, and so it, it, it's one of those things where I, I think it gets, again, I think it gets politicized. I mean, it, it goes, go back to Colin Kaepernick, right? And, and very few people talk about the fact that I think there was an army ranger that came to him and said, look, Right. That's right. You want to protest. Right. Here is the way to do it respectfully. Right. Right. And, right. Did, um, right. and, um, and so in, in my heart of hearts, I said, you know what? I know what Army Rangers go through. I, I get that. If, if, if this guy had an Army Ranger that came to him and said, look, right. I, I wouldn't do it that way. But if you're going to do it, here is a respectful way to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. No respect for me. Right. 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 Well, I certainly want to say that uh, I want to honor you and celebrate you for your continued service uh, to our nation. Uh, everything about you, Reggie, in terms of your value system and how you were raised and the, the story of even your parents and then your grandfather and what he sowed into your life. Uh, and I see all of that. I hear that in your voice from the very first time we ever met, man. Uh, there was a, a level of honor and respect in you and humility that's uncommon. And I would say that you uh, represent and embody the best of those who serve our nation. And I want to just make you the focal point to say thank you uh, for your service. And uh, thank you for your willingness uh, to sacrifice your own life that uh, that we might be free. And so I'm going to give you the final word, Reggie, if there's uh, anything you want to say to us in closing, man, uh, I appreciate you. Yeah, I, I'll just say this. Um, this platform, man, that uh, you and Tommy have here, man, uh, the guests that you have on the show, um, the folks that are in your audience, um, I've had a chance to engage with a few of those folks, man. And um you know, this is a really special place. I, you know, I, there, there's no negativity here. Uh, there is, there is enlightenment. There's, 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 there's knowledge being shared. There's awareness being raised, self-awareness being raised. And, you know, it, it's a, it's a really special place, man. And so I, whenever I get an opportunity to, to, to get invited on, either just show up at the show and, and listen or be invited on as a guest, it's a it's a really special place for me because I think in this show, the very first show I was on, I think something happened, Eric. Uh, and what happened is I realized that my dream was being treated as a side hustle. Mm. And <laughs> my side hustle was acting as a dream. Mm -hmm. It couldn't sustain. So I have moved my dream back to where it needs to be. And my side hustle now is being treated as a side hustle. Right. That happened on the show. So I thank mm -hmm. you for coming for that. Man. Well, man, we are uh, uh, grateful to have you as our friend. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, the continued growth and work that's to come. 
You've got a book on the way, man. I know you're at the beginning of it, but talk to us. About you're further than the beginning. You've actually got a, a good bulk of it kind of put together at this point, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm turning my dissertation, man, on communication effectiveness, helping leaders communicate more effectively with their followers into an actual book. And I, I wanted to put some space in between finishing up the dissertation and writing the book so I can get away from some of the academic speak, right. if you will, and then get some stories and examples and make it more relatable. So I've got um, I've got a good solid outline done right now. Excellent. And every every morning, man, I'm getting up uh, and I'm putting work into that first. <laughs> I love that, man. Uh, you are taking care of self, your purpose, your vision, your dreams first. Yeah. And so we appreciate that. Well, uh, community, we want to thank you all for joining us for another of our weekly conversations uh, in diversity conversation. I'm so grateful that we had with us uh, this morning, Dr. Reggie Crane, uh, professor, uh, communicator extraordinaire, and wonderful human being uh, to sort of help prepare us to celebrate with not only our mouth and our stomach, but with our heart and our minds, uh, those that have uh, made the ultimate sacrifice for us to have our freedom. Take care. You all love each other and uh, eat well, pray well. Take care. Bye now.